All right, salam everyone. Uh, welcome to our third discussion on the Samoada Network. Um, this week we'll be talking about the um, the attacks that happened in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, but we first just wanted to welcome everybody who's joining us uh, via Facebook or YouTube, wherever uh, Google Hangout. However, you are uh, choosing to join us. Ramazan uh, Mubarak to everybody. Um, please remember, uh, as we as we have this conversation and as you uh, as you watch and as you listen. Uh, you know, do your best to chime in, and we want to hear people's opinions, people's thoughts on things. So, uh, we encourage all of you to uh, comment on the Facebook page, uh, so that way we can um, hear some of your thoughts and some of your questions and uh, respond to those things. So, uh, please, everyone, if you can, just go on the Facebook page, um, have the event page open while you're listening or talk, um, listening to us, and comment, make suggestions, make some questions, and we'll do our best to address them. Uh, but just to get us started, we'll go ahead and uh, introduce ourselves, uh, just talk briefly uh, your name and where you're from, and uh, just be patient. Anyone who's listening, we might have some technical difficulties. Some people are uh, not where they normally are, so just, uh, you know, hopefully the connection will be okay, but uh, be patient with us. So we'll go ahead. Uh, Ali John, you're on my left, so uh, we'll go ahead and start with you. Salam, uh, I am Ali. I am a historian, writer, and a PhD student at the University of California in Irvine. Arash Chan, go ahead. Uh, salam, everybody. Uh, my name is Arash. I live in Washington, D.C., uh, work in broadcast journalism, uh, mostly cover. Capitol Hill, U.S. Congress, but I've covered uh, Occupy Wall Street, uh, other social movements. Uh, most recently, I covered uh, the aftermath of the um, unrest, I would say, in uh, in West Baltimore. And I've also worked with uh, an Iranian youth organization. I've been a council there, a staff member, and a uh, member of their staff and PR team. Thank you, Arashan. Uh, we'll go to Dawood. How's it going, guys? My name is Dawood uh, from Orange County. Myself and Ali co-host a podcast together every week where we talk about different social issues as well as what's going on in the nerd community. <laughs> Elijah? Hi, my name is Eli Kamal. I'm from Fremont, and I'm a financial auditor. And Nura John? Uh, Nura, you're on mute, so get yourself off mute and then we'll go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Nura. I grew up in the Midwest. I live down south in Durham, North Carolina. I'm a PhD student at Duke University. Cool. Uh, and we'll go to Saba. Um, salam, everybody. My name is Sabo. Um, I'm from Ohio. I went to law school in San Francisco, and um, I focus on criminal defense work. So, pleasure to be here. And Ramazan Mubarak to everyone. And we'll go to Lema. Hi. Uh, my name is Lema. I'm from Fremont, California. I currently work in Sacramento as a policy advocate for a civil rights and human rights organization. Um, I am currently working on a racial profiling and use of force uh, data collection bill that I hope to put into law uh, that has to do very closely with the issues that we're going to discuss today. <laughs> Awesome, and I think we just caught uh, Reza. So, Reza, if you want to just briefly introduce yourself. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, I live in Southern California. I'm currently an instructor at Kaplan, and um, I've done some uh, community organizing work uh, in the past, both uh, uh, sort of in Colorado and in Southern California. Cool. And again, my name is Omar. I'm from Fremont, uh, but I work at UC Santa Cruz. Um, uh, coordinator for residential education, so I work with students that live on campus there. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, just jump into um, our topic for today. Uh, so as you know, we had kind of a s interesting start time. We usually been doing this on Thursday night, so hopefully we get more East Coasters on this week. Um, and uh, you know, with Ramazan, we had to kind of adjust the times as well. 
Um, so we're glad to have Arash, who's representing the East Coast, and, and Nora, who's, who's kind of east southeast. Uh, so uh, ho hopefully you guys can bring some of your, your networks out here as well. Um, so we'll go ahead and just get started. Um, so first thing is, you know, it's been two weeks since uh, Dylan Roof killed nine people in the Charleston, um, South Carolina AME Church, um, a historically black church that was um, famous for a uh, slave rebellion that occurred, or a, a kind of squashed rebellion that uh, occurred year, um, during slavery. So um, what were people's reactions upon hearing the news? So I just wanted to kind of touch on people. Uh, you know, and ask ask folks what they what they think about what they thought about the incident, what happened. Lama, did you want to get us started? Go ahead. Yes. Um, so initially, when I just heard the headline, mass shooting in church, I wanted to die because I was like, is this another um, Muslim extremist trying to um, make a statement and? I wish that I didn't have to say this, but I was slightly relieved <laughs> when I found out it wasn't. And even though, like, that should not um, take over anything that actually happened, that was my very initial response to what happened. And, you know, in the work that I do, I'm very. Lema, I think we, Lema, we lost you there for a second. Um, let's uh, let's go see someone else, and then we'll get back to you when you get a better connection. But uh, someone else want to jump in? Just talk about your your reaction. So we'll go to Saba and then Nora. Um, when I heard about the incident, I was, I was horrified. Um, the one place outside of your home that you should feel safest in is your place of worship, and to think that something like this could happen, you know, in a place of worship, just, it terrifies me. And that was before knowing exactly what had happened, just knowing that there was a shooting, and that, you know, nine innocent people who went to go pray that day, they were massacred. Um, and then when I found out, you know, who did it, and what their reasons were, I mean, I was absolutely terrified um, to think that this this kind of hate this kind of hate is dumb. Dumb. Well, I mean, that was my initial reaction. I mean, that was my initial reaction. Yeah, uh, I can uh, offer that. I, I used to live in D.C. I, I used to live in D.C. Am I echoing? Am I echoing? Yeah, I think you're echoing yeah, right, now. You're so right, right now. Make sure. Everyone else, can you get on mute? Go ahead, Nora. So um, I used to live in D.C., and when I moved, um, Durham is four hours south of, um, of D.C., so people say it's not really the south, but when I moved here, and for folks who haven't lived in the south, even, even as north in, in, the, in the southern regions, you do really feel the history of violence that um, exists in terms of how um, whites have acted towards African Americans. And when this happened, this has sort of happened in a series of events that have happened in North Carolina and in the South of like aggression towards African Americans this year. But this is definitely been the worst of it, right? So it was just sort of like, what's the line? And this, like uh, Sabah John said and Neymar said, this sort of crossed the line in terms of even a house of worship, right? And the AME Church is sort of historically known for bringing together people. So when you're going to one of the most peaceful and uh, loving communities in Charleston doing this, it's, it, it brings back memories. So for people who have lived in the South and lived here, it sort of rehashes old wounds and pain. It wasn't something surprising in the sense that this has always been happening here, but the fact that it happened now, 2015, with the new generation, it brings back a lot of pain and scars that like communities here have felt. And, and seeing that and talking to people here, you really, I think, get a, a deeper understanding of how, how like, far this history goes with the communities here. And Arashan, I think Arashan, you're going to chime in. Yeah, um, my, my first reaction was, uh, so there seems to be all this like recent focus in the past few months, well, basically since August of 2014 on, you know, how pol police brutality kind of is, is this tool that's used against uh, communities, uh, communities of color, but especially like black communities. Uh, so this anti-black racism uh, is 
what, what it showed to me is that it's not just one. That's just, police brutality is just one facet of that. It's just one tool of that. Um, white supremacy works in many different ways. Uh, it works through economic oppression of communities, but it also works through the police, and it also works through uh, hate groups who are uh, through gun control or lack of gun control, I would say, um, are allowed to commit crimes like this. Uh, secondly, it also showed me that, you know, on, on the media, I work in the media, so uh, I have the experience of how narratives are made and created and how things are portrayed. So, you know, we are looking at the Middle East, we're looking at Iraq and Syria, and we're like, oh, how these people are so, like, how, like, how can um, ISIS do these incredibly, like, deprived things to people who are pretty much look like them? like themselves. Uh, and then we see here at home um, that somebody can just walk into a church, sit there for an hour, uh, <laughs> pretend to be a member of that community uh, in a place of worship um, and do that. So to me it showed that that, that hate is not um, just that it doesn't happen in the Middle East. That's everywhere. It doesn't belong to just the Islamic community and around the world. Uh, it's everywhere. I mean, it happened in Norway, uh, and it's happened in Charleston, and it happens in Iraq. So that's what it showed to me. Um, and though, John, I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, uh, when I first heard about it, like, as sad as it is, the first thing that came into my head was, again, we're really dealing with, like, another mass shooting. Because how many mass shootings have we dealt with in the past like few years? It feels like I'm seeing more in the past three, four years of mass shootings than I've ever seen in my life, uh, at least here in the United States. So it kind of just got me thinking, like, really, we're, we're doing this again. Yeah, I, th I also was thinking about, like, just like in history, right? Like, we've, we've learned so much about how how these churches were attacked and were burned, and um, and there's this, this really long history and legacy of these types of attacks on um, on black churches and in the black community in particular. Um, so I guess my first reaction was, I, I, I guess I didn't understand why that connection wasn't being made even quicker, because it seemed like when I first heard about it, um, people were just talking about the incident and, and not kind of talking about the history and the legacy of, of this type of violence that occurs. Um, I think it started to happen a little bit later, um, but uh, I definitely got that impression. And I also kind of share what, you know, some other folks said is, like, this is a place of worship. And, you know, it makes me think, like, someone can actually just walk in and do this. And, you know, we've, we've heard about, like, a Sikh temple that got, um, the people got murdered there, and we, you know, now that we have this at a church, and... You know, with all the Islamophobia that around, like, you know, I don't know, like, when, you know, is a mosque is going to be the next target at some point? Like, is our, our, you know, our places of worship safe, you know, or is that something we need to start thinking about? Um, so, I don't know, that was something that kind of came into my head, too, and I've been thinking about as well. Um, so, uh, Nurajana, you think you wanted to chime in, so I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, I just want to jump in on that. I think Sabajon might remember this, that this, um the Islamic Center of Greater Toledo in Ohio, it's the oldest mosque in Ohio. Um, they had a bomb planted there a couple of years ago. And it's the community I grew up in and Sabajan went to when she was younger. Um, it's, it's a major community for a lot of people. And the bomb went off and the water sprinklers sort of just let it, no one died, alhamdulillah, but the mosque was damaged for over a year. And I will say that coming from that community, it took me over a year and a half to walk in back into that masjid again because I just couldn't get myself to do it after it worked. I didn't want to see the damage. I didn't want to see what had happened. And no one died, right? It was just property damage, right? So imagine if people had passed away like they did in Charleston. That sort of psychological, you know, these are a place of worship, which is a place of love, is now attached to trauma and fear. So I think that these are serious questions we have to keep asking ourselves because, like you said, oh my John, it keeps happening. And um, who knows who's next? Uh, Eli, go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, just fitting into what Narjama was saying, you know, I would be really afraid of any copycats going out there, especially, you know, they see this on the news, you know, someone attacking the flash, you know, what if people that are born in the back of Masjid, they come out of this idea and 
you know, after that Dark Knight shooting in the movie theaters, everyone was so afraid of copycat shootings in movie theaters, and people were so afraid, and they were changing their routine. So, I mean, I could easily see this, well, I'm not going to be, like, tr uh, triggering uh, copycats in the Muslim community or any other community, you know, someone wants to attack a synagogue or a temple, like, all faiths should be really afraid right now, to be honest. Ali John? Yeah, I, I want to echo what everyone else is saying, and I think um, we've already seen it. It's not just a matter of who's next. Um, in more recent memory, just a, a matter of a month ago, you had a quote-unquote free speech rally outside of a mosque that involved armed people showing up. While no one was shot, that's an act of intimidation. That's an act of, of using guns as a means of oppressing a minority group and threatening a minority group. Um, and it's not just uh, mosques and churches, it's also schools. The two places that you should be safe in are school and your place of worship. But Sandy Hook, you know, one of the uh, mass shootings that happened in American history happened you know, at a school. And these are things that we need to, to address, is why are they happening? Uh, there's a history there. Um, and what is the root cause and how do we address it? Because what we saw happen in Charleston is not an isolated case, and it certainly isn't going to be the end. You know, it's not an aberration. This has become normative. We're watching the news, and we see this happening time and time again, and we need to start asking why. So let's actually um, dig into that a little bit and just and, and, and ask that question. Um, you know, that this was kind of the second question uh, that we have for our uh, discussion was, you know, is why why did this happen? As Ali John just said, why did this happen? Do you think it's an isolated incident? You know, what are those root causes that we need to to look at in terms of uh, how we how we address this? So, um, let's let's take some time to talk about that. Why why did this happen? Reza, um, well, I, I don't think it's unclear why it's happened because the the shooter said why it happened. Uh, the shooter said that uh, he wanted to start a race war. Uh, I mean, he wore a patch of Rhodesia on his shirt. Uh, he um, accused black the black community of r raping white women and taking over America. So uh, it's, but I think uh, um, not a better, but uh, another question we could ask is. Uh, how was someone like Dylan Roof uh, allowed to grow up into becoming who he is now, right? What about our culture and what about white culture? Because there is a white culture, and I'm not saying all of it is bad. There's some great aspects of white culture, but uh, there are some dangerous aspects as well. And what about those dangerous aspects allowed someone like Dylan Roof to continue on that path? Maybe he started off asking a question of why do black people do this? And why wasn't there someone to stop him from going down the path that he went down? And what other facets of our culture propped up his continued journey down this dark path? Um, that is something that I would uh, love to hear people's opinions on because why he did this is clear. He wanted to kill black people because they were black. Um, but how is he allowed to continue to walk down this path? Uh, that's that's something that I um, am not clear on myself. And I think uh, uh, Lema, you wanted to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. More attention to what's happening in the South and and going to understanding what the Confederate flag means to these people. I think from what I've Lema, you're, heard... You're, you're breaking up, so I'm going to go to Ali John first, and then we'll come we'll come back to you, okay? Poor Lema John, her tech, <laughs> her tech problems. I want to hear because I heard Confederate flag, and I know that's going to be a really good point. Um, but I think that the simple answer to why this is happening is because in America we live in a culture that glorifies guns and devalues black bodies. And that's the type of society and culture that we live in right now. And to parse this even further, we have three strains of things going on here. First is an issue of race. Why is, you know, there's an issue of white privilege and devaluing black people, right? So this shooter openly says that he saw black people as a threat. That's one part of it. 
Second, when this news broke, the race and the religion of the shooter was not overly clear. And same thing with the uh, shooting that happened at the Dallas PD, the James Bulware. When that shooting happened, um, I asked, the, one of the things I asked was similar to what was asked before, was this a Muslim who did it? And the reason I asked that, because they didn't openly say, oh, this man was a born-again Christian and he was white. That's white privilege, right? That a person who is a white shooter is not identifiable or, or reduced to their race or to their religion. So that's the racial component. Then there's a gendered component here, right? He talked about the myth, what is known in academia as the myth of the black rapist, right? You are taking our women, you are raping our women is what he said. So there is a sexism and misogyny that's going on there. And then the third aspect is gun culture. We live in a society where even having a debate about guns, about whether there should be regulations, receives heavy, heavy criticism and pushback. Guns are considered more fundamentally part of American society than equality is, and that's one of the problems that we face. Eli? Yeah, I was going to say one of the other things is um, just, I guess, the culture in the South and how I think a few of the states, I don't think South Carolina is one of them, but several of the other states that used to be in the Confederate, they have a Confederate History Month. I think it's in April every year, and they celebrate that history and all the connotations that that brings with them. So it's just so ingrained in the culture, I think, and that's, that could be one of the reasons that contribute to someone being able to be raised in such hatred like that. And Reza, go ahead. Um, I, I, this may be jumping topics, but uh, <laughs> when it comes to the Confederate flag, um, it's it's not as ingrained in the culture as we think it is, or as, as the South tries to pretend it is. Uh, there's an amazing article that the Atlantic published uh, right after the Char um, right after Governor Haley uh, called for the Confederate flag to come down that spoke about the commodification of the Confederate flag and how really it was uh, money that drove this sort of uh, narrative that this is a part of our culture, this is a part of who we are, that the South now tends to cling to. But in reality, that only happened in like the last century where uh, the Confederate flag was suddenly on the roofs of cars, was being printed in flags and being sold in so many different places uh, as, a, as a tool for businesses to get money in that region of the country. And so uh, I think that if we, uh, sometimes it's not useful to combat long narratives like these with facts because yeah those facts are not heard by other people, but I think we can combat it at the level of utility. Uh, how useful is the Confederate flag for the South nowadays? And I don't see it being that useful, and I don't see any good argument from the South for how useful that flag is. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, this, this uh, notion that the South has and that we outside of the South may have that the Confederate flag is a real part of their culture, um, uh, it doesn't bear out in history, and um, it also doesn't bear out in its usefulness for them. And I think, Nura, you were going to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, there is a sub... It's interesting because we do see it there a lot, and there's certain gas stations. There's, once you leave capital areas, you notice it a lot. And, and, and the emotional impact I think it has on people it's forgotten in, in sort of common discourse. People are debating, oh, well, it's part of Southern history, but honestly, like, if you're not white and you roll into a gas station, you see, when I see a huge Confederate flag, I'm like, I'm going to the next gas station. I refuse to stop because I'm not part of that history, but for me, it even evokes a certain level of fear. And when uh, Ali John was talking about sort of the gender part of um, what happened with the killer was saying, oh, black men have raped women and things. There's a story here that a uh, generation of men, I think in their 40s, my professors were telling me, when they were growing up, they were saying, never look a white woman in the eye. And you may be the next Emmett Till. And Emmett Till was um, this um, teenage boy that was from Chicago and visited his family in the South and got brutally killed because he um, either hit on or flirted with a white woman. I'm forgetting the facts. But the point is that um, this generation of uh, black men in the South have been told from a young age, like, you need to watch how you look at white women. Because there is this perception of them that white southerners had that they treat women a certain way and so people are telling their children like don't look certain people in the eye otherwise you will be attacked for 
you know, looking at someone because of the color of your skin. And so that sort of reality is really um, scary to see that, you know, Dylan will pick that up and is you know, advocating that right now to a new generation. And Ali John, go ahead. I think uh, Nura John brings up a, a fantastic point, and, and she's right. There's that history of gendered violence that intersects with race. Um, to pick up on what Reza said, I don't think in any way, shape, or form Reza, the, the, the Confederate flag is jumping towards. I think it's, it's emblematic of exactly what we're talking about. Um, and you're absolutely right. The history of it is so bizarre, and people don't know it. It's, first of all, it's not even the Confederate flag. The Confederate flag has all these multiple ma manifestations, but they talk about it as the sign of the Confederacy. It's not. It's the sign. It's a battle flag. Um, furthermore, it wasn't adopted until the late 1900s. I think it was 1960s. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'm not an American historian. I'm a historian of the Middle East. Um, but what's fascinating is that in this conversation about the flag and the glorification of the flag and the glorification of the Confederacy, and there's this talk of, well, it's part of our cultural heritage. And I'm led to ask, what exactly are you, are you upholding? A failed inter insurrection based on race slavery. And that goes right back to my point that in this country, and especially in the South, there's a glorification of guns and a devaluing of black lives. That's what that Confederate flag means. And so when people insist over and over again that it's part of our heritage, what they're saying is that they want to uphold that part of their heritage where a, a rebellion happened, a failed rebellion against the United States of America, a treasonous rebellion happened, and all based on the fact that they wanted to continue the economic exploitative um, system of racial slavery. I think that's very emblematic. So that flag isn't a, a misnomer, it's not a misdirection. I think it's very much comes to the point of the problem within the society and culture itself and where our values are. And uh, there is a question on Facebook, Iman John put, uh, is asking, what does this incident say about the continued conversation about being a progressive post-racial society when the rhetoric around how this incident was portrayed in the media was incredibly racialized? Um, so this was a comment that was um, on, on, uh, on Facebook. So does anyone want to uh, take a stab at that particular question in terms of how the media... Um, was portraying this particular uh, particular issue. Go ahead, though, John. Well, I mean, first off, they were trying to act like they gave him the benefit of the doubt that he was mentally disturbed from the get-go. They tried to say that it was more faith-based, at least on Fox News, that he was it was an attack on Christianity, even though he clearly said, "I want to kill black people," while he was shooting black people at a historically black church and they, they, they came off as they weren't using words that they would use with like black criminals they're saying this kid you know he's a whacked out kid they weren't saying he was a crazy man they're trying to kind of humanize him and give him excuses for why he committed the crimes as opposed to like just calling him out for what he actually did at least that's what I saw out of it and uh, also, uh, and also uh, oh, oh, let me get some folks on mute. Folks on mute first. Um, the yeah, the 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 whole idea of a post-racial society, I think, is like. I mean, I think you know, Iman John put it in quotations for a reason. Uh, but I think what this particular incident did, and what I wish the media did more of, and they started to do a little bit, is to really talk about the legacy and the history of these types of attacks, like this this type of really heinous terror, literally terrorism that goes again, that, that has been endured by these people for so many years. Um, you know, there is the, uh, the, the, the move, there's a movie about it and the story about four little girls that died in Alabama and a church bombing there, um, I believe it was in Alabama, but um, you know, this, this is a long history and the, the whole notion of a post-racial society, even seeing like you know, Obama gave that speech um, in the in the black church um, yesterday. I don't know if anyone um, got a chance to see that. He gave the eulogy um, for the the reverend who um, who passed away, uh, who was murdered in that in that attack. Um, and you can just kind of see, you know, the the cheers and you know, when, whenever he spoke about the Confederate flag, the entire 
Um, you know, 5,000 people in the audience stood up and cheered, and it's, it's, it's real that racism is alive and real today, and I think that um, I, would, I would have hoped the media did a better job of portraying that, and I, we'll see kind of where that conversation goes along. Um, Arashan, I think you were going to add something, am I correct? Or? Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. My, uh, my main point with the uh, media portrayal is, is that one of its main failings, and this goes back to August, uh, I mean, first of all, the media was completely absent from any kind of debate on whether it's like police brutality because it's been going on forever uh, or any other kind of uh, uh, violence against black communities. It, it's failed kind of, it, it keeps it keeps uh, covering these individual cases, uh, whether it's in West Baltimore or whether it's in Ferguson or whether it's now in Charleston. They keep covering these single issues. Uh, what it kind of it's like trying to, it's really struggling at trying to uh, bring this all together to give some like historical context that but like violence against black communities is multifaceted and happens in many ways and it's been happening. Now finally, finally kind of like the New York Times did this uh, entire piece about absent, how the, the, the black male is so absent uh, in black communities because they've been just thrown in jail for whether it's like minor offenses. Uh, they've basically criminalized being a black male. So finally they're coming around to do that, but it's failing to portray uh, the, all these different incidents which seem isolated, but they're def like they're definitely not, right? Like Just like the Arab Spring, the things that are happening in Ferguson are inspiring to people in Baltimore. Uh, like, and finally, slowly it's coming around, but it has a lot of, uh, a lot of work to do. Even, even in Ferguson, uh, they were failing, they were just focusing on this small town in Ferguson, but this whole system of uh, arresting and pulling over people of uh, color or just people in the black communities, ticketing them, and then them failing to be able to uh, pay their tickets, and then they get thrown in jail for minor traffic offenses. So this was a cycle. And it took them months and months to like publicize this story, and they also failed to publicize the fact that it wasn't just happening in, in Ferguson. It was happening in every municipality in St. Louis, in all these different neighborhoods, and every town, and every city across the United States. So that's also another media portrayal. We all, we talk about the double standards of the, the how they uh, covered this roof kid, and then how they covered Michael Brown. But there, there's more, more media failings happening that we're not necessarily paying attention to. And uh, to go on to um, uh, the next question is just kind of talking about uh, the word terrorism and what, what that means and what has that meant to us. And, and just kind of like, it, is this considered a terrorist attack? Is it important that we even consider it one? Um, so I just wanted to kind of touch on the, the use of that word um, and what that means, and I think that a lot of people were talking about that um, right after this happened. Um, so I'll let Elijah go ahead and start us off with that. Yeah, I mean, even just setting the, the word terrorist attack aside, just the fact that it was a hate crime, I think South Carolina is one of the only a few states in the country that they don't have hate crime laws. So that to me was baffling because I had no idea that that was the case until I read an article about it a couple of days ago. But I mean, he literally can't be charged as a hate crime since it doesn't exist in his state. I don't know, Sava, you're the lawyer, if there's some federal jurisdiction there, but that to me, that the fact that they can't even go after him with that, just because it's just such a symbolic gesture to show and label it as a hate crime, I feel like it just has that much more effect for the country in showing that this is a hate crime. It's not just a random shooting or a murder. Um, it was directed specifically against this race of people. Reza, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that it's it's actually kind of astonishing how much I've seen uh, the label of terrorism attached to this incident from the wider media. I mean, there's the the Guardian was calling for this to be called um, a terrorist attack. I mean, uh, I've seen more discussion of this being labeled a terrorist attack than I have in the past. Uh, with white shooters uh, going on a murder spree, and that was astonishing to me. But at the same time, a thought uh, was introduced to me by a friend of mine. And so this isn't this isn't me. I'm just uh, I'm relating what he said to me, and he spoke to me about how the notion of terrorism and the word terrorism was changed so radically 
by the events of 9-11 and the trillions of dollars and the blood and sweat and the decades uh, that we have spent in Afghanistan and Iraq fighting these wars, uh, that this notion now implies uh, someone who is transgressing against a hegemony or transgressing against a norm, right? And uh, whether they be Muslim or not, I mean, because there are uh, Latin American groups that we have also labeled as terrorists before. Uh, terrorism now in our post-9-11 society, in our post-9-11 world, uh, has entered into lexicon as transgression, right, against an overarching dominating force. But that's not what Dylan Roof is doing. Uh, he is part of a su supreme system. He is part of the hegemony. Uh, he is an arm of this uh, of the dangerous aspects of white culture uh, that have pervaded and hurt and terrorized, I'm using that word again, uh, black individuals in this country since this country was founded. And so while I don't see any harm in calling it terrorism, in fact I feel like that's a step forward in calling it terrorism, I think that what we should keep in mind in discussing this is that there was no transgression against the hegemony here that Dylan Roof was doing. The norm is not uh, good treatment or peaceful treatment or um, helpful treatment of black individuals. The norm is harmful, threatening, intimidating treatment of uh, black individuals. And Dylan Roof was just uh, another instance of that norm, of that hegemony, exercising uh, its horror on the black community in America. Uh, Nora John, go ahead. Yeah, um, the word terrorism now, I think, as I was saying, post 9 11 has changed, and it's such a racialized term, and I think we keep talking about this, right? Like, if you do like a psych, psych test to someone and say terrorism, there's a certain image people evoke, and it's usually like a Muslim person or someone with a beard, right? Um, the issue, the implications also, though, is that when we use terrorism, like that, it has a lot of reverberations into the sort of public policy and money that we use, right? And we, and when you look at the media, they give this case nuance where they don't just say it's terrorism. Some people, some commentators, may be saying, oh, it is terrorism, but on a whole, in terms of headlines, you know, like the CNN scroll, you don't see that happen as much. You, know, you see that with, the, like, grassroots movements and people on the ground saying that more so than people on the headlines. And I wish we would see it more in the headlines because when it comes into headlines, when it comes into media discourse, that's when policy changes. And I know the Southern Poverty Law Center, a lot of civil rights organizations have been pushing for actions like what happened in Charleston to be considered terrorism because then they can actually get more support, like um, like Eli Jarman was saying, changing laws and things to make sure things like this don't happen again. But until then, it's sort of been this like, racialized word we only use for non-whites. And until we change that, I don't think we're going to get in place protections that will protect minorities from the violence of um, the dominant group. And Ali John? I think uh, Nuru John is absolutely right. And it's the, it's the privilege of white privilege, if you will, that um, their acts of violence are not quickly attributed to acts of terror. There is a racialized language when it comes to terrorism. Terrorism is become, especially post 9-11, a predominantly brown crime. It is often seen, even in cases of domestic terrorism, as having a form of foreign quality to it. And this is a serious problem. And I don't think that it's, it's accidental. This is a very deliberate interpretation of terrorism that f supports a certain political ideology. Um, we, and, and my bias as a historian is going to show out, um, in the academic community have been pushing more and more to relook at terrorism. For example, we find that in the wider discourse, terrorism is almost always equated by about 95% of the population to some form of religious cause. And yet, in the case of actual terrorist studies, like for example done by Roger Pape at the University of Chicago, um, and 98 percent of every known terrorist case within the United States has no connection to religious justifications, but are politically motivated, or racially motivated, or economically motivated. And yet that's not the discourse that is happening in the public. 
And that's something that we need to ask why. Why is that not happening? In academia, we are pushing against this, but it's not penetrating into uh, the wider society. We are not talking about, while certain commentators are saying, oh yeah, this was a terrorist act, it is not a predominant narrative that when a white person walks into a church and kills black people, that that person was a terrorist. The predominant narrative is that he was mentally unstable, was that he was a lone gunman, was that he was a quiet kid, right? That's the narrative that we have. And in order to, to really affect change, in order to really destabilize that, we need to have, start having these conversations. We need to start saying that, no, terrorism can be racially motivated, that yes, white people can be terrorists. I mean, just some statistics, Dylan Roof killed more people than ISIS has killed, more Americans than ISIS has killed. And yet today we talk about ISIS as the predominant threat to the United States. More people have been killed from gun violence last year alone. We've had 12,000 deaths in the United States from gun violence alone last year. That's more people killed from gun violence than 9-11. These are statistics that we need to seriously look at and it helps us to reconsider the designation of terrorists and the racial component within it. Sabajan, go ahead. Um, so, should this be classified as terrorism? Absolutely. Um, Dylan Roof's words were, and his actions were meant to incite fear and terror upon a population. He intended to start a race war. There could be nothing more terrifying than that. Um, so, it, and I'll get back to this later. I wanted to answer Haley John's question first about um, the legalities behind, you know, South Carolina not having um, hate crime laws. I actually wasn't aware of that, so I just learned that now. So thank you, Hilai John. Um, the way hate crime work in the legal field is when someone's charged with a crime, if it's a hate crime, if it's racially or religiously, for whatever reason motivated, it enhances the charges. Um, so it's really interesting that South Carolina doesn't have hate crimes. I'm not surprised. However, Dylan Roof is charged with nine counts of murder and the maximum punishment in South Carolina for murder is the death penalty. So, you know, I'm not quite sure if having a hate crime attached to it is going to do anything in terms of punishing him. However, in terms of, you know, showing the people that, you know, the government does see this as a hate crime and that hate crimes will not be tolerated is, is extremely important. Um, people can't feel safe if their government isn't going to protect them from things like that. So you know, there there needs to be a movement. Um, I'm not too familiar with the federal aspect of it. Um, if federally, if there can even be anything done about that, because the state handles this. But um, one thing, and this goes back to the points that you know Ali John and Nuro John were making, is that um, terrorism, the way it's the language that we use, that is used in um, discourse, is that it very much associated with a group of people and um, that happens to be people from the Middle East and post 9-11 that's exactly what happened but one thing that I'm noticing in just the field and the line of work that I do is just how much that can impact people um, who are you know charged with crimes um, very you know non-violent non-serious crimes at times too is um, when this type of terminology is associated with a specific group of people there's um, repercussions that are irreparable. You have people on an FBI watch list, right, because they're associated with that group, whether or not they're actually involved in any type of activity, um, because of a fear that they might actually carry out the type of action that Dylan Roof carried out. Um, so how that impacts them in the legal field is I've had people come in who've been charged with crimes but are actually on an FBI watch list. And the district attorneys, the prosecuting attorneys, are not really willing to budge on um, lowering the punishment or you know coming up with a deal because they're on an FBI watch list. Even though the reason why they may be on a watch list has nothing to do with the crime that they're being charged with. Like for example, possession of a drug. 
that is enough for them not to want to make any kind of negotiation. It might be the reason why they push somebody into trial and, and subject them to something much more harsher, much more stricter than what they should be um, getting. And so I just wanted to throw that out there as well. As when we have um, the word terrorism attributed to a particular group of people, it has very, very, very significant impacts um, you know, in their life in different areas and, and just this is just one area where I've seen it have an impact um, and it's, it's horrible. Um, it should not be attributed to one particular group of people and that is going to require a serious movement um, for us to call out situations like this where um, it is very clear that it is an act of terrorism. Uh, Elijah, I'll let you answer and then I'm going to ask, a, I'm going to pose another question. Okay. Go ahead. Sure, thanks and thanks Saba for getting back to me on that. So just responding to what Ali John was uh, bringing up about the uh, political narrative and the agenda, you know, I think that it's so much easier for these politicians when they're running to run on that platform of protecting us from the others, from the foreigners, and it serves a purpose both for getting them elected and then also for whatever um, purpose they have, you know, if you believe all those conspiracy theories about like people going after oil or just, you know, like the whole military industrial complex, it all serves a purpose for political gain and for money. Um, no one's going to run on a platform and talk about, you know, protecting Americans from Americans themselves, from homegrown terrorists or from, you know, basically white people that you can't really identify them. It's so much easier to identify a group of Muslims or a group of uh, black people. But, like, when you're trying to point to these disturbed white people, like, how would you ever put them together in a group to classify them? It makes it so much harder and it would just basically have to turn everything upside down and no one's willing to step up and do that. Um, and I wanted to uh, bring up a, a question in rela relation to a little bit into the, into the word terrorism. And um, someone, uh, uh, there's an Afghan civil rights lawyer who messaged me and was saying, um, just talking about the the word, and is saying, are are we degrading ch the Charleston uh, the Charleston shooting by demanding that it be subject to the term terrorism? Terrorism is an ill-defined term calculated to elicit fear and quick approvals for pretty much mob mentality. Charleston should be called by more concrete terms, hate crime, multiple murders, and then those issues need to be worked on. Um, so I think we've been kind of resonating and saying, uh, communicating that a little bit, but um, Alijan, if you want to go ahead and share your thoughts on that. I think uh, that's, a, that's a great point by uh, the lawyer. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't catch the name. I think he's absolutely right. Um, and I think th that what this invites us to do, first, is to really look at the violence that's happening within the United States, right? Um, so again, multiple things going on here at the same time. First and foremost, talking about guns, right, and gun violence and how it intersects with racism and, and misogyny, right? That's a very important conversation to have that's not being had within the United States that we really need to take a look at. More people are dying by their, by guns in the United States than any other form of violence. And there is a profile to the type of shooter, but we don't want to talk about that profile, right? We talk about racial profiling Muslims and black people. We don't want to talk about that the predominant shooter in the United States is white, young, and male. Okay? So these are, this is the first conversation. The second conversation is the conversation about terrorism itself, and he is absolutely right. Terrorism is ill-defined, and it remains so. There are attempts within the academic community to try to understand how the term is used, what is the function of the term, and it is very difficult to do so because terrorism intersects with a variety of different terms um, that are complicated. It intersects with things like insurgency, with rebellion, with revolution. Um, for example, uh, when one of the things that I have, I've pushed for is to look at ISIS as a movement, of, as a revolution. And that's the way to actually look at them because in our mind, revolution automatically equals neoliberalism and prog progress and whatnot. The revolution can absolutely lead to something like ISIS, but we can't have these conversations in the public yet. They are happening in academia. I don't think it's a disservice necessarily to use the term terrorist for the shootings in Charleston. I think it's a symbolic victory. In the same way that adding a hate crime may not increase the legal ramifications or the consequences, but certainly would act as a symbolic victory if we were to apply hate crime 
to this particular uh, situation. But the, it does invite us to really take a look at the term terrorist itself in prison and look at the definitions of it. But more importantly, ask how it's being used, not just the way it's being defined, but how it's being used. And I think that's a really important conversation to have. Um, so I wanted to shift this a little bit. Um, Alema, you said you wanted to. Did you want to comment? We want to <laughs> get you on here at some point, and I know you've been having some difficulty. So, uh, did I, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. I just want to uh, make a comment to solidify some of the things that John is saying when it comes to um, gun control and, and what it means in terms of um, race and. And so on. When I was working at the assembly from um, 2012 to 2014, um, our district received over a couple thousand emails per year um, stating, "Please don't vote um, for uh, gun amendments. Protect our civil liberties and our Second Amendment rights." And most of these people had Anglo-Saxon and European names, which I found just so interesting how united they were and, and what this meant um, on a bigger level. Um, in that sense, I agree that this has to do with something of like controlling um, black men, Latino men, um, immigrant cultures are not allowed to, to have these um, civil liberties. They will always be charged as criminals if, if it, in a different way that someone with white privilege has. So I just wanted to share that anecdote about, you know, what, how it was working in an elected office, um, receiving these type of emails at such a charged, masculine way. Yeah, and um, that was kind of what I was going to lead to anyways, was like talking about gun control. Um, we talked about... Um, We'll briefly just talk about like talk about gun control in terms of what that needs to look like in the future. Because a part of what I think too is um, I know there's talk about more regulations on gun control, um, and you know perhaps having you know back, more background checks on the people who purchase these weapons. But um, does does having more laws when when we when we make more laws, who does that end up criminalizing? And that's something that um, you know I think about too. Is 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 if we do create these laws, who is going to end up kind of paying for it or end up seeing a lot of the jail time as a result. You know, we look at communities of color, uh, black and brown communities that are, end up get, being responsible for a lot of the minor drug violations that exist. So um, just some thoughts on, on gun control and would like to hear uh, what, what, some other, what some other folks wanted to share with that. Um, Arashan, go ahead. Yeah, I feel like gun control is seems like a worthy cause and something we should fight for. Uh, we've seen gun violence uh, destroy different communities. Uh, but I feel like gun control is strictly only going to further criminalize people of color, especially black communities. They're just going to, uh, in, in my eyes, I feel it's like another excuse to use a set of laws um, that will further uh, criminalize black communities. They're going to continue to put um, majority black males uh, into jail using these uh, new gun laws. That, that's, that's, what I, that's what I hear when I hear gun control. Uh, and I also don't think further gun control in this country is an achievable goal if we want to look at this realistically. Uh, if 12 dead uh, toddlers and 8-year-olds in an elementary school is it's not enough, and if it's not enough for nine people praying in a church, then, I mean, I, I think it's just not realistic to think of gun control as something that will uh, be something that is going to uh, set the goals that we set forth, which is to prevent these mass shootings. Um, Elijah, go ahead. I mean, in my opinion, I think if someone has their mindset on hurting people, it, the guns aren't an issue. Like, they could easily go online and learn how to make a bomb. He could just have driven his car through the church as a last resort and to hurt people. So I think at the end of the day, we need to talk about the source of the problem and, you know, why he had this strong urge to want to um, hurt these uh, black people and why he was so um, against that and set in his mentality. 
at the end of the day, once he had decided that he wanted to go out and kill people, it really what he what tool he used, it doesn't make a difference. Like he was still going to cause the damage no matter what. Uh, Lema John, did you have something you were going to add? Yeah, I agree with both what Arash and Eli John had to say. Um, I go back and forth with the idea of gun control and not allowing citizens uh, to have it or having stricter regulations. Uh, just because then that would mean that the source of all weaponry would be in the hands of our local law enforcement, um, state police, and then um, our federal uh, SWAT teams and, and military. And that makes me nervous that if we, you know, take away these particular liberties, then we're in the hands of our government and we don't have control of our own lives. However, I do know that Guns are not the sources of, um, just like what Hillai said, of, of pain and suffering. It, it's the person who has the ill intent. Uh, but I, I tend to go back and forth about like what the real solution can be. Um, obviously, regulations would help, uh, but I just don't know to what extent, going off of what Arash said about like who's actually going to get indicted for these um, crimes. And um, we'll let uh, Daoud, John, and Ali John kind of end on this on this topic, and then we'll um, start wrapping up. Now, while I agree that the guns aren't the biggest problem, it's still a problem nonetheless. Yeah, these people were gonna, if they wanted to do a violent crime, they would have done the violent crime by another means. But we're giving them a tool to commit the violent crime. Like, guns don't really serve a purpose besides ending something. The reason why you purchase a gun is to protect yourself from somebody like invading your house. And what are you doing? You're shooting that person. You're trying to end their life. Uh, I think we need stricter regulations on guns. Like we have stricter regulations on people getting cars than we do on guns, and it's insane that this kid could just his dad could just give him a gun, and then a few weeks later he goes and uses that same gun to kill nine innocent people. Like we shouldn't be putting tools in people's hands that can murder people that easily. At least that's my opinion on it. And Ali John? Well, I, I fully understand the hesitation about gun control. And I get it. And rightly so, I should say. That yes, that more regulations and laws will, Im because we have a system that is race-based, right, that has racist and uh, is based on inequality, that it will impact a certain group of people. But I also believe that um, these regulations can be productive and helpful. We know, for example, that when there was an assault rifle ban that was done during the Clinton era, that it had an effect. That the majority of the mass shootings that we have had have happened after the ban on assault rifles expired. That's a statistical anomaly, right, that we need to take a look at. Why is it that when the ban on assault rifles expired, mass shootings went up, right? Why is it the countries with stricter gun control like the UK, have a lower rate of gun violence. We had 12,000 people die last year. They had less than 10. That's a serious problem we need to take a look at. Now, of course, there are statistics, you know, there are a lot of issues with statistics. There's population that we need to look at. We have a wider population. There's different social norms, different cultures going on there. But these are things that we should take a look at. Secondly, the idea that um, that our weapons are meant as a means of protecting us against the government, while I fully understand, is actually antiquated. This is an argument that the Second Amendment people keep pushing forward, right? This is our way of defending ourselves from the government. We will never win in an arms race with the government. We won't. It's just not going to happen. They outspend us. They'll have the latest technology. And even if we have AR weapons, we do not stand a chance if our, weapon, if our government turns to a certain type of violence. That's, that's no longer an issue. Second, there's a long history of the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment was meant to be to create militias, right, in the United States because we didn't have a strong central army. We do have a strong central army now. There's no longer a need for an armed 
citizen populace. So the historical conditions have changed and we didn't recognize that. We weren't even an armed country back then. The arms that we have now are all post-World War II. So as times are changing, we need to relook at this. Now, I'm not saying get rid of all guns. I'm not saying that we need to eliminate them or ban them. But we should start rethinking gun regulations and gun control if we see that it does have a productive and positive effect if the historical conditions have changed from when these laws were originally put into place, then it's time to start rethinking these laws and time to start rethinking some form of regulation. If it means saving a few people in school or in church, I think it's worth the discussion. Thank you, Ali John. Um, so uh, we'll just wrap up. Um, and uh, if people just have some comments on how do we respond as Afghans and um, in our in our communities, in our kind of spheres of influence. Um, what, in what ways do we respond to these types of incidents and how do we address these types of issues that we talked about? Um, some of the bigger, maybe some of the bigger picture issues and, you know, some of the smaller things that we may have mentioned. Um, so, just want to give everyone the opportunity, um, not everyone has to answer, but, you know, just if you'd like to share what you think we can do as a community. And I'll go ahead and let Arashan start us off. Um, I think as... Uh, people of color, uh, we have an obligation. Silence is absolute complicity because we were talking about the word terrorism earlier um, and many, uh, many, many, many innocent Muslims have been caught up in this web of entrapment. Uh, just to put out one example of how Muslims are terrorized uh, in this country. Uh, many, many Muslims, innocent Muslims, have been uh, entrapped by the FBI since 9-11. I mean, there's just an article that came out um, on The Intercept, uh, and I'll post it in this group later, about how just basically these innocent Muslims have been uh, <laughs> uh, thrown in jail, basically for nothing, by the FBI because of the, the, the laws, that, the federal terrorism laws that are in place. Uh, so if we are ourselves are uh, targeted and are basically up for grabs by the FBI and the federal government, uh, for us to not speak out, for us not to educate our parents, uh, but mostly people that are our age and younger. We have an obligation to uh, also give context, right? We, I talked earlier a little bit about how the media portray, uh, fails to uh, connect all these dots. If we do not do that for our family members, our friends, uh, if we just sit there silently let people get away with uh, making certain comments and using... Uh, coded words in regards to certain incidents, um, we, are, we are complicit in the violence and the terrorism against black communities in the United States. Um, uh, I think for, for our community, I think thinking about all the different topics and uh, points that we brought up, you know, we brought up that there's a long history of this type of violence that occurs. Um, to the black community and I think we need to really look at that history and what that is and learn that and embrace that and I think it'll help us in our attempts to become allies kind of like what Arashan was saying and, and you know helping with other communities of color um, and, and working with them. If we don't understand their history and their struggle I think we won't be effective in, in our attempts to, to work with them, work together with them. Um, you know analyzing what type of um, you know this this was an you know anti-black you know racist crime and um, murder and so we need to look at how that how that you know plays out in our community and I know we've you know done that in previous conversations but we need to continue to do that um, because you know Dylan Roof at some point was making like probably making racist jokes making saying certain things and um, you know we have to look at what what we surround ourselves with what we hear what we see and you know um, and step in when we when we do hear those things um, in terms of you know gender, look at look at what the role of gender and you know how he felt like he had to protect women and he had this kind of this notion that um, I'm protecting women and I'm gonna and, and because of that I can you know go ahead and start murdering these people and using that as justification for for his actions and not necessarily everyone's gonna be you know going to the level of action of murder but you know people do take action in the name of of, of gender and this kind of uh, sexism that exists. Um, so we need to kind of check that as well. Um, and then lastly, and you know, on the topic of gun control, um, you know, I, th I do think we need to make sure that our voice and our opinion is heard on that on that issue. And um, some of us may live in states or places where you know gun control laws are pretty strict, strict. But it still means we still need to be present in those conversations. Still need to 
make sure our, our opinions and voices are heard, whether that's through voting, attending town hall discussions. Um, you know, in, in some way, we need to get involved in those conversations, whether that's gun control or whatever it may be, um, looking into those things. So those are kind of my, my thoughts on that and how we can respond as a community. And I'll, um, I know I spoke a lot, so I'll give some other folks a chance if they want to wrap us up. Nora John, and then I'll let one more person if anyone has something to say, and then we'll we'll say goodbye. I mean, this is kind of simple, but the people who are in the masjid, I know, like Moana Amazon at night, they you know, like make prayers like peace and stability in X Y Z country. They're always naming like Palestine and Afghanistan, and I it would be really meaningful if even in like a space like the mosque where we have the older generation, if there are like real points of peace in Charleston, in places like that, like building that empathy in our community. So I. I just use the mosque as a reference point, but any sort of space that we go to, because I think the one issue, and I think this came up in the Ferguson conversation we all had, was um, bridging this divide, making sure that the generation above us, our parents, our aunts, and our grandparents, understand the struggle too, because they're the ones that are helping teach our younger generation. So that I think our generation has a sense of what's going on, and we're building it, but making sure that um, the generation above us has a sense of sort of the struggles, because this is not true that taught or required when people are taking citizenship tests or whatever, but um, building that empathy and even like small actions, I think, a long way. And Elijah John, I'll let you have the last word. Okay. Um, so this morning I was in Oakland um, volunteering for this uh, youth program called Oakland Youth Aspire. It's basically served predominantly black children ages like 3 to 15, um, and it's open every Saturday. It's a free program. The kids come by and um, they have um, a variety of set activities and also free time just to socialize and the program director uh, was telling us how last week the kids had a whole session um, where they talked about what happened in South Carolina and these are kids like I said 3 to 15 talking about their feelings you know the older kids and their perspective and the little kids how they were um, viewing that and they um, they made cards to the victims and their families and just I really wish I had been there last week to see that in person but Something very simple like that is, you know, like go out in the community, get involved, hands on, um, work with the the black youth. Um, I'm sure there's uh, programs like that all over the country that you can easily get involved with and just have a direct impact on them. All right, thank you, um, everyone, for uh, participating. We will uh, see you all. Um, Soon and and I think we've we've started. I know for some of you we may have um, heard about the recent uh, ruling um, on the Supreme Court case uh, voting uh, in favor of same-sex marriage. So I think that's something that we are definitely something a conversation that needs to happen within within our community and something we will um, try to touch on. So I want to kind of put that on people's radar right now uh, to look for that coming up, and uh, we will send you all um, you know messages to kind of give you a heads up on what that looks like. Uh, but thank you all for tuning in today. I know it's Ramadan, so everyone's kind of schedules are a little bit weird. Um, but we appreciate everyone tuning in, engaging in this conversation, commenting on Facebook, the panelists, everyone who's here. And we will uh, see you all soon. And thank you again for joining us. Bye-bye.